This is an introductory lecture to ensure everyone understands the basics of point of care echocardiography. The overview for this lecture will hit on the five important points of point of care echo, including transducer selection, cardiac windows, basic cardiac views, cardiac anatomy, and cardiac proportions. When you start your cardiac exam, you will want to choose the correct transducer. You will select the phased array transducer, also known as a cardiac probe, for these images. You'll have to note the probe marker seen here. It is a very important aspect of any ultrasound probe. You need to know the probe marker location to ensure a correct orientation for your images. Here's an image of the heart as it lies in the body. Notice that it doesn't fit in the typical sagittal, coronal, or axial planes. It has its own set of orthogonal planes that I'll be referring to. First off, we'll talk about the long axis plane, which obviously goes along the long axis of the heart. Orthogonal to that is a short axis plane seen here. And then finally, the apical plane shooting back up. One important point of the heart is that the apex of the heart is actually at the most inferior portion of the heart, where the base of the heart is actually at the superior or cranial part of the heart. So that will be an important point to know for the rest of the lecture. In order to image the heart, we need to get a good sonographic window, and we'll take advantage of the big three windows here. First and most important are the parasternal windows, which are just to the left of the sternum. Next, we'll move on to the apical windows, which is located at the apex of the heart. And then finally, the subcostal windows or subxiphoid, which is located just under the subxiphoid space. One important point is that when your BMI increases, the axis of your heart shifts slightly. And you'll notice here that the apex of the heart is slightly farther lateral and the axis of the heart is shifted somewhat. So now we will use those three windows to find our four basic cardiac views plus the IVC view. There will be two parasternal views, one apical view, and then one subxiphoid view with an IVC view thrown in at the end. We will first start with the parasternal long axis view since this will be the starting point for the majority of your scans. We'll use the parasternal window that we discussed on the last slide with the probe marker pointed to the patient's right shoulder. Initially, we want to make sure we have enough depth so we can determine if there's a posterior pericardial effusion. But once you've done that, you can shallow your depth to focus on the chambers of the heart. The criteria for a good parasternal long axis view include actually cutting off the tip of the left ventricle. You want to have visible mitral and aortic leaflets. You want a horizontal axis to the heart. And you want to be able to recognize the descending thoracic aorta seen here or right here. This is going to be your view to evaluate for left ventricular ejection fraction using some of the various methods such as E-point septal separation or fractional shortening. And we'll look at the rule of thirds, which we'll discuss in a few slides. We'll next talk about the parasternal short axis view. We'll still use the same cardiac window as the last view, but now we will rotate our probe 90 degrees so the probe marker is pointed to the patient's left shoulder. We will get this image here, which is called the mid-papillary view, because the papillaries are seen right here on the screen. You'll have a circular left ventricle and a crescent-shaped right ventricle here. Now, it is slightly confusing because there are multiple views of the short axis. You can actually move more towards the apex or the base of the heart, but let's stick with the mid-papillary view right now. You can use this view to evaluate for left ventricular ejection fraction, wall motion abnormalities, or the right ventricular size and interventricular septum movement. Next, we'll move on to the apical four chamber view. This is by far the most difficult view, but it's excellent for advanced hemodynamics since blood flow is typically moving towards and away from the transducer and therefore the Doppler signals are the best. The probe will be placed in the apical window, usually under the left nipple or inframammary fold. The probe marker will be placed towards the patient's left arm, but the actual probe will be pointed all the way back to the patient's right shoulder. Here, we will evaluate chamber sizes using the rule of thirds, which I promise we'll discuss. It's basically the concept is the RV larger than the LV. If the RV is large or you're concerned for the RV function, you can measure the right ventricular function here. And finally, once you get comfortable with this view, you can actually do a slight variation called the apical five chamber, where you take the tail of the probe and tilt it farther downward to reveal the fifth chamber, which is actually not a chamber at all, but it's rather the LVOT and aortic valve. Finally, we'll move on to the subxiphoid or subcostal view. Those terms will be used interchangeably from here on out.
The transducer is placed in the subxiphoid or subcostal window seen here with the probe marker pointed to the patient's left arm again. Usually you're going to have to bring the tail of the probe down so that the transducer is nearly laying flat on the patient's abdomen. This requires you to change the grip of the probe. Now your probe will be held like a computer mouse with your index finger applying pressure for better contact to the patient's body. Also, you may need to have the patient hold a deep breath in order to view the heart. This is going to be your best view to look for cardiac activity and whether there is a global pericardial effusion uh, plus or minus signs of tamponade. Technically, this is not a cardiac view, but the IVC is often visualized in the cardiac exam, so we'll discuss it here. We'll keep the transducer in the same window as the sub view, but now maneuver the probe so that the sound waves are aimed directly through the patient's body and the probe marker is pointed down. This is a point of contention between cardiology and emergency medicine. Cardiology points the probe marker up, but since I'm EM trained, I point the probe marker down. You must be able to visualize the right atrial IVC junction as seen right here. We'll evaluate the size and collapsibility of the IVC to determine volume status and tolerance. Now, if the IVC is flat, your patient is almost certainly tolerant of volume. However, if the IVC is large and does not vary with respiration, we cannot determine if the patient will be fluid responsive. This is outside the scope of this lecture, but let me refer you to my video using the LVO VTI in this situation. We will now discuss normal cardiac proportions, which we refer to as the rule of thirds. If you have a normal heart in the parasternal long axis view, you should have a equal left atrium, aortic valve, and right ventricle. We don't measure these, but we eyeball them and say that they are all about of equal size. If you move into the apical four chamber view and looking along the long axis here, two thirds of the heart should be the ventricle and one third should be the atria. And then finally, if you're looking in this plane here at the mitral annulus, if you have one arbitrary unit here, your RV side at the tricuspid annulus should be about a third left. And finally, if you look at the apex of the heart, it should be dominated by the left ventricle and not the right ventricle. Here we see normal cardiac proportions where we see the left atrium, aortic valve, and right ventricle all approximately a third of the heart. If we move on to the apical four chamber, we'll see that two thirds of the heart here are taken up by the ventricle and one third is the atria. And then finally, if you look at the mitral annulus compared to the tricuspid annulus, the tricuspid annulus dimension here is about a third left of the mitral annulus. If you see a heart that does not have the proportions that we just discussed, we're going to try and determine where the pathology is located. Here's a normal heart, and here's a heart that has a violation of the rule of thirds with the left atrium. This is most commonly caused by chronically elevated left ventricular and diastolic pressures, or commonly referred to as left-sided pressures, uh, most commonly seen in heart failure. However, Mitral stenosis or mitral regurgitation uh, can also cause the pathology as seen here with thickened mitral leaflets causing mitral stenosis. Again, here's a normal rule of thirds, but here is an abnormal heart with a violation of the rule of thirds from the aortic root. This is commonly caused by thoracic aortic aneurysms or in the emergency department, we are always concerned for aortic dissections. And finally, again, here's a normal heart if you have a violation of the rule of thirds from the right ventricle here, you'll notice that it's a lot bigger. Um, this is caused usually by pulmonary hypertension, which could be either acute or chronic. We can discuss later how to determine the difference of the two, but you'll want to look at separate views to try and determine if they have other signs of pulmonary hypertension. This is another view of a patient with a normal heart on the left and an abnormal heart on the right. This patient on the right has pulmonary hypertension. We've already discussed that the RV should be approximately one third less than the LV size. Here you'll notice that there's about a one to one ratio. In fact, the RV is slightly bigger than the LV. And notice that the apex of the heart it is now dominated by the right ventricle instead of the left ventricle. In summary, to perform a bedside cardiac ultrasound, you're gonna use your phased array probe. You're gonna utilize your three cardiac windows to make four basic cardiac views. You're going to use the rule of thirds to explain normal cardiac proportions, and you're going to look for violation of the rule of thirds 
to clue you in on cardiac dysfunction or valve dysfunction. And to end my lecture, I uh, want to end it with an AI-generated picture, in which I typed in doctor using bedside ultrasound to diagnose a patient with heart failure. And I had this strange old and new medicine mix of images. And of course, the fingers are very messed up.